Questions of human flourishing are uh, fundamental to most people and um, it's certainly been a topic of, of academic uh, discussion for uh, centuries, millennia. And so in many ways I feel the university is uh, an ideal place to study it. Moreover, when we deal with questions of human flourishing, we are talking both about what, what is the good life, um, which is a question of important philosophical and theological uh, depth, but we are also trying to consider how to, to bring it about. And um, that is often a question that some of the empirical sciences can help us address. So I, I think we really do need uh, interdisciplinary perspectives to study human flourishing well, and consequently, the university is an ideal place to try to carry out such discussions. Yeah. Uh, well, different academic disciplines, I think, approach these questions in, in different ways. Uh, philosophy will often attempt to unpack the concepts that we are employing and uh, clarify our thinking, draw important uh, distinctions. Uh, theological ideas and uh, traditions will often provide extraordinary depth with regard to how these things have been understood over the um, centuries and how they might relate to the pursuit of, of God. Um, in the empirical sciences, social sciences, the biomedical sciences, uh, we often try to collect data on individuals uh, over time and examine uh, what factors contribute to and detract from human flourishing, at least on average, but then also uh, in different subgroups of the, the population. So each of these disciplines has uh, a different uh, academic approach, but I think it is most valuable when they all come together. Now, so what human flourishing looks like, I think, is not something which we can really address through the tools of the empirical sciences. These are philosophical and, and theological uh, questions, but in the work we've been doing at the Human Flourishing Program, we've, we've tried to draw upon um, much of the, the philosophical and, and theological depths of, of, of various uh, traditions, and including uh, principally the, the Christian uh, tradition. And um, the way we've been thinking about flourishing is to acknowledge that uh, there will be differences, important differences, across different religious and, and philosophical uh, traditions. Um, but to come to the question of what might we have in common, around what aspects of flourishing might there be consensus. And so what we've been examining in our own work are the following five domains of, of human flourishing. First, happiness and life satisfaction. Second, meaning and purpose. Third, mental and physical health. Fourth, character and virtue. And fifth, close social relationships. The argument is not that these five exhaust what flourishing means, but that any conception of flourishing, while it might include a whole lot more, would also very likely include these five domains as well. These five domains are nearly universally desired, and each constitutes its own end. And so I think those two criteria, being universally desired and being an end in and of itself, can perhaps help form some consensus on how to uh, study flourishing and measure flourishing within uh, an academic context which is uh, pluralistic and which, in which there are uh, reasonable competing conceptions of flourishing. So with regard to uh, the role of virtue or character in human flourishing, um, for pretty much all of the Western uh, philosophical tradition until relatively uh, recently, and really many uh, religious and philosophical traditions worldwide, virtue was considered an essential part, maybe the most essential part of, of flourishing. Uh, the working definition we've been using for flourishing is a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good. And if one's character is not good, one certainly cannot claim that all aspects of one's life are good. Um, having, being a good person is something that almost everyone uh, desires, and so it would seem um, not a good idea to neglect it in our study of flourishing. Um, there can sometimes be disputes with regard to um, 
can we really obtain consensus on these questions of character? Once we move into character, isn't there too much disagreement to make any progress? And I think those claims have been exaggerated. Um, so if we turn to what in the Western philosophical tradition are called the, the cardinal virtues, the idea that at the foundation of all moral virtues lie four, uh, prudence or practical wisdom, justice, fortitude or courage, and, and temperance. If we, if we turn to those four, I think on these there, there in fact can be considerable uh, consensus. Uh, we might ask, for example, with regard to uh, practical wisdom, um, if you, who, who amongst you would want to be foolish? Or, or with regard to courage, who wants to be cowardly? Or uh, justice, who wants to be unjust? And, and again, responses would, responses would almost uniformly uh, be, we know these things are important. So I think there are aspects of character around which we can have consensus even in a pluralistic context with competing uh, notions of what flourishing is. With regard to the relation between um, virtue and, and public health, I think that is a more complicated uh, question. I, I think it's fairly clear from uh, much of the research that uh, various aspects of, of character uh, shape behaviors which go on uh, to shape health. And um, we don't talk about these questions uh, very much within public health. I think some of it is a reasonable uh, concern that if we were to draw too close of a connection between uh, character or virtue and health, then it might feel that those who are having health difficulties are somehow morally uh, to blame. And one sometimes comes across uh, this, this logic in, in religious communities and, and elsewhere. And I think it's, it's problematic. Um, not all instances of disease or, or illness are, are due to a, a failure of character. But I think that's very different than saying that uh, one's character and one's behaviors really do powerfully shape one's subsequent health, at least on, on average. And so we can find ways to uh, develop and um, try to promote character, both for the sake of health and well-being, but also as its um, own end. One of the areas which we've been working on in this regard has been uh, forgiveness and uh, health, and numerous studies have suggested that forgiveness is related to better subsequent health and uh, well-being. Um, there have even been randomized trials of uh, forgiveness workbook interventions to try to promote uh, forgiveness for those who want to forgive and are struggling uh, to do so. And these trials have found these forgiveness interventions have promoted forgiveness, but have also reduced depression, reduced anxiety, increased hope. Um, these workbooks could be disseminated quite uh, broadly, and if so, um, if they really do have these profound effects, not only on forgiveness and on relationships, but also on mental health, I think an argument can be made that forgiveness itself is an important and uh, powerful public health intervention, something that's not only of moral and um, relational and theological significance, but of public health significance as well. So the role of religious community in public health, I think, is a topic that has been neglected by the public health community. Um, and there are now numerous rigorous research studies using uh, very large samples and longitudinal data that have indicated that participating in a religious community is associated with better health and well-being subsequently, associated with a 30% reduction in all-cause mortality over a 10-year time, uh, associated with a 30% reduction in incidence of depression, a five-fold reduction in, in suicide rates. So these are really big um, uh, facts. And um, I, I think the public health community hasn't wrestled sufficiently with how religious communities do shape population uh, health. We often think of the importance of a uh, public health intervention or exposure or phenomena as a function of two things. At one hand, how common it is, and on the other hand, how large are its effects. And on these grounds, religious community is a powerful social determinant of health. It is common. This country, about 36% of the population report attending religious services on a weekly basis, and its effects on health, as I've described, are really quite profound. Um, in terms of trying to work out 
the consequences of this for thinking about population health. There's been, as just one example, there's been recent concern expressed about the uh, rising rates of suicide in uh, the United States. Those jumped from 10.5 per 100,000 per year in 1999 to uh, 13 per 100,000 per year in 2014. The Center for Disease Control released a report expressing concern um, over this. Um, during the same period, the Gallup poll indicated that religious service attendance in the United States had dropped from 43% in 1999 to 36% in uh, 2014. And if one takes uh, the results from some of these studies and extrapolates it to the whole population, it would indicate that of that increase in suicide rate, about 40% of it was due to declining religious service attendance. So these things have a powerful effect on population health, and I think one uh, that is too often ignored by the public health community in trying to understand uh, how population health is shaped. Uh, likewise, one finds effects of uh, religious community and many other uh, well-being or, or flourishing outcomes. Uh, participation in religious community affects not only uh, health, but also has been shown to increase levels of happiness and life satisfaction, greater levels of meaning and, uh, and, and purpose, greater charitable giving, greater volunteering, greater civic engagement, uh, uh, less likelihood of, of divorce, uh, greater social support. So it, it, Participation in religious community affects profoundly all of these um, outcomes. There, there was some concern with many of the original studies that they were methodologically uh, weak, that they didn't control for enough at baseline, but these studies have become stronger and, and stronger. Um, and uh, there are now, as I said earlier, large studies uh, which have followed people over time, controlling for the outcomes at, at, uh, at baseline and numerous other factors which uh, still suggest these associations uh, persist. So I, I really do think uh, religious community is a uh, powerful force in shaping health and well-being. Moreover, one of the other interesting aspects of this work is it really is that communal aspect that is important. One doesn't find such strong associations with just self-assessed spirituality or with private practices. These things can be very important in one's own spiritual life and development, but don't affect these other flourishing outcomes uh, as strongly. It really is that religious communal element, the bringing together of the community, the social interactions with the religious beliefs and values that seems to be so essential for shaping so much of health and well-being subsequently. So in an era in which people increasingly identify as being spiritual but not religious, we, we might question whether um, these people are missing out of something very powerful of that communal uh, religious experience, uh, certainly something very powerful for health and well-being and possibly much else as well. As I said earlier, I think in terms of understanding what flourishing is, we need to turn to the philosophical and theological traditions. But once, uh, once we have a certain conception of flourishing, or at least uh, domains of flourishing uh, that, we, that we want to study, and once we've crafted measures, ideally with the uh, help of, uh, of philosophy and, and, and theology, um, that's when the empirical sciences, the social and the biomedical sciences, can, can come into play. And what we can do is try to collect data on these measures over time, as well as other social and demographic and health and um, political or economic variables. And we can try to see which variables affect which others. Uh, what are the important determinants of, of happiness, of, of purpose, of character, of good uh, relationships? And while we do this very well for health and we do this very well for uh, income, uh, we don't do this so well with some of the other outcomes. There has been some important progress with regard to the study of happiness, principally from the positive uh, psychology literature. But in terms of rigorous studies of what shapes a sense of purpose in life or how is character formed, we have very little good data. Uh, to date to address these very important questions. Um, it does sometimes uh, strike me as remarkable that we know so much more about the determinants of cardiovascular disease, say, than we do about the determinants of a sense of purpose in life, despite that being desired uh, by, by almost everyone. So I'm entirely in favor of trying to rigorously study cardiovascular disease, but I also think the same sorts of research efforts should be 
um, uh, made to, to, to study the determinants of meaning and purpose. And that's some of what we're trying to do at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard, to collect data over time in different settings, workplace settings, medical settings, uh, factory workers in Mexico, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, China, um, to try to understand what is shaping character, what is shaping purpose, how are good relationships formed, using the same tools that are done um, for health and for economic outcomes. So I think the Christian faith and Christian theology have uh, extraordinary uh, ideas and, and, and traditions and practices to bring um, to the study of human flourishing and um, also to the attainment of, uh, of, of human flourishing. Um, I think uh, the Christian faith uh, provides a very uh, rich and, to my mind, <laughs> truthful and accurate uh, picture of the whole of reality, of how um, life began, what are its origins, uh, what, what is the final end of the uh, human person. How do we make sense of suffering in this world? How can we love and help others? And I think these frameworks uh, provide that sense of meaning, that sense of purpose, which so many uh, long for. Uh, I think certainly some uh, of the ideas from the uh, Christian faith can uh, be employed more, more broadly, even among those who wouldn't share a similar theological perspective. I think some of the work on uh, forgiveness, which is quite central to Christianity, uh, can be employed outside of the religious context to, to promote forgiveness, to promote um, goodwill towards the other, that replacing of ill will with goodwill towards the uh, uh, offender, which has been shown to powerfully shape health and well-being. Um, as we discussed earlier, religious community itself uh, powerfully shapes so many different aspects of, of health and well-being. I think the very notion of love, so central uh, to the Christian faith, um, Christian life is sometimes described as uh, love of God and love of neighbor, and I think um, the empirical research we have to date suggests that love itself is a powerful determinant the trajectory of an individual's life from the love a child experiences um, from, their, from their parents uh, to love within the marriage uh, context and how that uh, powerfully changes uh, lives, how it powerfully contributes to well-being. So I think we can um, draw upon the Christian tradition to uh, point towards important resources for flourishing. Um, but of course, the center of the Christian faith is not so much flourishing in, in this life, but uh, a final communion uh, with, with God, and that is what uh, the tradition, Christian tradition points towards uh, through the life and death and uh, resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. And so if that is uh, one's fundamental goal, that, that, that communion uh, uh, with God, through Jesus, through the church and the community. Um, and I believe that that is the final end of the human person. Um, then, of, of course, the Christian faith, the Christian community is absolutely essential uh, for, for attaining that. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you. Great. <laughs>